Um, uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to the uh, British Empire Study Group. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs, uh, Bob Gray, and the other co-chair here today is Joe Farmer. Um, the British Empire Study Group is a group of men and women that are interested broadly in, in British philately. And um, it starts, I guess, with the first stamp collector, John Gray, no relative, and the first um, um, stamp dealer, Stanley Gibbons. And British philately spread throughout the British Empire. And if you think about all of its colonies and all of its wars, there's probably very little on the planet that has not had something, um, including post offices abroad, that has not uh, been impinged upon by uh, British Empire philately. So what exactly is philately? Well, that's uh, stamp collecting. I think stamps and albums and the like is what most people think of, but it's also postal history, the rates, routes, and markings and history itself, because a lot of uh, postal artifacts can be relevant, relevant items for historical research itself. So normally uh, we meet in the uh, Collectors Club building in uh, Midtown Manhattan. And of course, these days it's been mostly uh, Zoom. Uh, our next uh, talk will be Peter McCann, who will talk to us about uh, uh, Dominica, the development and study of postal systems and inland post office mid 1700s through uh, World War II. So a little housekeeping. There will be a um, uh, optional poll uh, in this uh, presentation, really. Uh, questions will be live, but feel free to choose the Q&A. Uh, following the presentations, there will be some time for social discussions and we'll bring you into, uh, into that afterwards. And if you'd like to uh, dis disable or close capt captioning, please click on the live transcript and hide the subtitles. If you don't see it, uh, click more and you'll, uh, you will see the live transcript selection. Now I think I'll turn it over to Joan to do the introduction uh, uh, to our speaker. Joan? Thank you, Robert. And thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, it's a hot night here in New York and uh, Robert's cool in his basement, so I'm really envious. And Michael looks comfortable too. I guess I'm the only one with uh, uh, who's uh, challenged. Anyway, Michael has specialized and collected in Holy Land postal history for over 50 years. He's the former president of the Israel Philatelists, and he currently is serving as the endowment chair. And he is a long time member of many different uh, societies, including the London Philatelic Society and of course the Collectors Club of New York. He's uh, of the APS, we can't forget our friends at the APS. He's exhibited Holy Land Philatelic uh, items from 1350 to 1850. And he's gonna correct me on all this because I'm probably bungling it. But uh, he's, he's really an expert in this area and is really our pleasure to welcome Michael. So Michael, at this point, I'm going, they don't want to hear me, they want to hear you. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And you, if you'd like, say a few words and then share your screen. Well, I would first like to thank the study group for inviting me to speak because uh, it's quite an honor. Um, to be a part of a different organization that I frankly haven't been that familiar with, but surely send me an application at the end of this and I'll be happy to join. Um, Joan, you have been so helpful uh, during these several months getting prepared and uh, your expertise on Zoom, I have to say is second to none. It's, it's really been eye-opening. Um, Bob, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you as well. And uh, on behalf of the three of us, I guess we thank everybody for joining and participating. So. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to get this hopefully correctly. There we go. And Joan, do you see that? Do you see my screen? I think we're perfect. Okay, good. So, um, as Joan indicated, I have been a Holy Land in Israel collector since I've been 10 years old. And uh, I've had some of the most marvelous mentors and friends, as many of you probably do as well, who have just been wonderful uh, 
to, to share this wonderful hobby with. And um, I haven't drifted outside of Holy Land in Israel. Don't ask me why, maybe because of economics, maybe just because of time limitations, but uh, I'm very passionate about the area. A uh, little background, as Joan mentioned, um, I span a very long history of the Holy Land going back to 1350. I call that the diaspora period uh, leading into the Ottoman period. Um, that diaspora period includes uh, the Napoleonic campaign, uh, you know, the ecclesiastical mail, things of that nature. So it's, it's a fascinating part of the Middle Eastern history. Um, I've exhibited, and I know probably a number of you on, the, on this Zoom meeting here, uh, know that I've exhibited Ottoman period 1850 up to World War I. And um, I've been incredibly blown away and fascinated because, you know, the Ottoman Empire was 400 to 500, 450 some years in existence and ended at World War I. So there was a tremendous amount of geopolitical change that were occurring right in that 1914 uh, to 1918 period which we're gonna talk about in a moment. Um, I've been fortunate to accumulate this collection that we're gonna talk about, and it's the specifically, it's the allied side of the um, military that served in the Middle East, specifically in the Holy Land and in Palestine, uh, starting in, in Egypt and, and moving up through that whole area that, that we'll talk about. Um, just an FYI, um, this accumulation has been sitting over and behind me here for decades, and it was during the pandemic that I decided to pull it out, like hopefully many of you, and just get to work to figure it out. Um, I'm going to just make a few comments about the complexity of this story, because I'm not a military man, and I respect so much those of you who have served in the military, and um, my deficiency is I just don't I didn't fully understand how military organizations were formed, uh, particularly in the, in the British side of, of uh, the campaign. Um, and so the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, which we're gonna talk about, I believe is an army, just like they had up in Europe and, and elsewhere uh, throughout the World War I and, or World War II. And I'm sure many of you know a lot more about how that formational stuff works more than I do. I have really worked hard to figure this out and it hasn't been easy because as you all know, it also intertwines into the Indian uh, expeditionary military, the Anzacs, the Australians, the New Zealands, as well as other various allies like the French and the, uh, in, and the Italians. Um, can, Canada even sent down a small, very, for a very brief moment in World War I, a small contingent from um, Europe, they sent them down because they needed to cross the Jordan River and they needed bridge builders and there was a Canadian contingent that had that expertise. Those aren't things we're gonna get into today, but you can, I'm trying to share with you uh, the vast complexity to this particular story. So we're gonna talk mostly um, about the background of the British in the Holy Land for a few minutes. Uh, they have a long history there. <laughs> Uh, which we'll talk about. The very early era of, of the war itself, starting in late 1914, 15, and 16. And then we're going to really spend the bulk of our discussion talking about the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, uh, which was led by General Allenby. And uh, the latter part of this talk, we're going to go through 1917, the battles that were fought uh, along from Egypt all the way up to Jerusalem and such. So, um, I know there'll be questions at the end and, and uh, my, my email will be at the end as well in case you have something later on that you wanna talk about. So here's the map. You know, um, most of you obviously are very familiar with this, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Here's that Port Said and the Suez Canal on the left side going all the way down. And this became a really, and still is as recently as the last six months, a very, very critical uh, Eastern to Western uh, supply chain waterway that uh, we're not gonna you know, delve into the politics of it, but, but it was built in about the 1870s, I believe, and um, was critical to the uh, empire that you're all aware of it. 
you'll see here that this is the Sinai and from the Suez Canal, you'll see that there's a northern route along the Mediterranean. Uh, Gaza's up, up in the area here. There's a middle route that, that uh, you kind of can see in the middle. And then there was a southern route too. And some of these are still in existence uh, because this is a major desert area. Uh, and so this small map down below here, I think kind of gives you a, a, a vaster sense of where Cairo is, where Jerusalem is, where Haif is, the area that we're gonna be talking about. Um, the Suez Canal w was and still is vital. And as you well know, uh, the empire needed to um, protect it uh, from being closed or uh, abused in some manner. I mean, it just happened in the last six months that it was closed out of, go figure that in this discussion, there's a real time uh, event that occurred. And so we all know what the consequences are economically and, and the movement of goods from the Far East to Europe or to uh, the Americas, the Mediterranean, uh, if that particular waterway was closed. So though the Ottomans actually controlled Egypt, um, the, the, uh, the British were allowed to have a protectorate military presence along the Suez Canal in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. And so, you know, this is kind of what the story, where this really story begins. Um, of course, you know, uh, here's an example of, of uh, the British uh, in embassy in Cairo. Um, this is a 1914 early and um, the military, this kind of proves that there was military presence going on in that particular area. Um, this of course is just before the war broke out. Um, now I got a lot of, uh, I apologize because I got a lot of stuff on my screen, some of which I don't know how to hide. So I'm gonna do my best to make sure I get everything. But this upper cover here was sent October 30th, 1914 from Cairo to Beirut. And uh, it was returned because as you can see, the communications were suspended, the war broke out. And so Bob, you asked me a little bit about that, you know, holding a mail thing before we started the, this discussion. And I, you know, this, was, this is one of the covers that kind of popped into my head. Um, Military, the, the, the civilian mail was suspended very early November um, and things were kind of getting chaotic at that time. Um, I put this little postcard down below because uh, this is actually was like a code um, that they used to send some mail in April, 1914. You know, there was stuff going on and somebody wrote this code. I just found it to be kind of interesting. Um, Right as the war broke out in October, uh, this is uh, early military hospital mail. There was an awful lot of it. Um, the Indian military really was the original uh, Suez Canal defense forces that protected the Suez Canal. Uh, they had the uh, IEF, the Indian Expeditionary Troops were, were there, the 10th Indian Division, the 11th Indian Division, the Imperial Service Cavalier, the Bikinar Camel Corps. I mean, when I started looking at this and thinking about how life was back then, you know, they didn't have water. Water was critical. They were using camels. You know, the railroad systems were evolving. I mean, they had sand and there was desert. So, you know, I keep putting myself back into the framework of that era. And it's just fascinating from a historical perspective. Uh, this lower cover actually is a New Zealand military uh, cancellation from the New Zealand military forces. They started bringing the New Zealanders and the Australians in first. This is December of 1914. The British, of course, were form, forming up in, in the European theater, and uh, they, they predominantly at that particular point in time were, were still operating under the Suez Canal defense which was a part of the whole military organization of the British. And uh, so this is very early in 1914. Um, this is also, you can see here, New Zealand Division Forces Mail, um, the Army Branch. Obviously, many of you know that the uh, YMCA was vital in terms of supporting the troops throughout uh, all, all of the campaigns. 
And uh, this one happens to be um, a New Zealand military male, uh, early February of 1915 from Cairo. Uh, below is the field post office. It's an Indian cancellation, number 312. Um, I'm gonna move this here uh, to France. And um, it's just, again, uh, they started to um, uh, censor the mail at this particular time. The war had just broken out. Um, and as you probably know, many of you, the Gallipoli campaign was happening in uh, 1915. And it's in this particular period uh, called March of 1915 that the reformulation of the reformation of the whole British military organization in the Middle East occurred where they designated this area called the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, uh, the MEF. This was the precursor to the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, which is the bulk of what we're gonna be talking about. The Mediterranean Expeditionary Force uh, fought from April through December of 1915 in the Gallipolis and the Dardanelles. Um, and frankly, they just got mauled. Uh, they were using British troops. They were using uh, Australian and New Zealand troops. And uh, this was all under the leadership of General Murray. And I'm going to pause for a moment and talk about General Murray because I had one of those aha epiphanies uh, about this gentleman because he actually was kind of um, shoved down into the Mediterranean. He, he did serve up in Europe for a bit. Uh, he was decorated at one point, I believe in the Boer War, uh, and, he, and he got injured and he never really got his faculties back together again. And so, but he was politically correct and you know, he was PC and, and they put him down in, to lead the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force and he kind of was a bumblehead. He just wasn't, you know, the leader commander of this kind of a, a campaign, which I contest is part of the reason that they didn't perform real well in, in the Gallipoli and the Dardanelles during the, fifth, uh, the 1915 period. The Mediterranean Expeditionary Force was made up of a whole bunch of division or corps. They had the Anzac Corps, they had the Eighth Corps, the Ninth Corps, they had a Western Frontier Force. Uh, they had the 15th Corps, and they had these Suez defenses that I was speaking about a moment ago. Folks, I got to tell you, to piece this puzzle together has taken me a long time just to figure out what corps was assigned to the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, what divisions were formed underneath these corps, and it's really been a, a fantastic science project to figure this out. Um, here's again some early mail. This is uh, 1915 August. Uh, this is sent to the director of the Red Cross. You can see censor marks opened by censor. Uh, things were starting to become formalized from a military mail perspective. Um, you know, and 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 uh, here's more Indian Expeditionary Force mail that was sent uh, um, with arrival mail pass censoring to the 42nd East Lancer Division, which you can see here. I have tried to collect mail that uh, was, was specific to military personnel. I think it's kind of a cool part, fun thing to collect it when you're talking military. There's not a whole lot of postage mark or rates that you can collect. This one here is um, uh, marked Mediterranean Expeditionary Force. And I just thought it was great to have this as part of this collection in the early stages. Uh, you can see prisoner of camp mail markings down here on the left from the November 1915 era. Again, Gallipoli campaign. The Ottomans were kind of dormant at this time. They weren't really doing a whole lot. The Turks were living over in Gaza and they were, they were fortified over there. Uh, they, they weren't really, they, they also were busy up fighting the Gallipolis in the Gallipoli campaign. So they had their hands full as well. And so anything that was uh, east of the Suez Canal was sitting pretty quiet during this particular era. Love this one. I'm sure you do too as well. It's so dirty that you just can't stand it, but love it. And uh, this is, um, I'm going to move my uh, thing here. This is a registered letter uh, sent from New York and it was sent to Corporal Robinson. It came back. Um, he was ultimately uh, killed. It's, if you can see my cursor up here, it was undeliverable because he was ultimately marked as killed. So it just is a well-traveled cover with a lot of registration, a lot of fun stuff. 
And, uh, you know, the fact that it was marked up here as missing and killed tells a lot about, you know, the gist of the story. Uh, getting into 1916, you can see the Italian, I, I put this in here because I thought it would be nice to show that the Italians had a presence in the uh, region as part of their allies. Uh, this one here, as you can see, was sent to a Captain Gaff in Egypt, and it was sent here from uh, the Italian group out in Europe. The one below is French mail. The French military also had a big presence. Not a big, I should say that, but they had a, a serious presence in the Middle East. Um, folks, I have to tell you, uh, we're still feeling the reverberations of, of so much of the, the political and, and military uh, elements of, of what came out of the World War I. Um, as most of you know, France really uh, took control after the war of Syria. And so the British and the French were kind of, you know, splitting up or looking at, at, the, at the Middle East uh, during this particular era. Again, we're talking about the 1916 before I, you know, I'm gonna launch into the EEF. I'd like to digress for a moment because it seemed to me that the British started getting very serious about this area and Churchill was uh, up, in, up in the war office. I mean, these are, these are major players that, I, again, I respect most of you understand quite well, probably better than I do, what was going on up in, up in London. Um, I think they really understood two things. I think they understood first that they had to protect the Suez Canal and their assets over in uh, the Far East and the economic uh, of, of the supply chain. And then secondly, I really believe that they saw the emergence of oil in the world and they clearly uh, were understanding that the, that the Middle East was a, uh, gonna become a, a vital part of the world's economy and uh, oil. And so, you know, they were, they were acting pretty serious about all this stuff. Um, just a quick little background. I am not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm an entrepreneurial style businessman. So my mind always shifts to the economics uh, more than the politics or the religious aspects, because I'm kind of like leaning in the direction that, you know, money usually plays a pretty big role in driving what, what goes on in these situations. So now to move into the Egyptian uh, expeditionary force, um, I'm going to start with the military organization. I'm gonna look at you know, the army and, and the corps and the divisions and the brigades and kind of walk through. Uh, this particular topic today is largely driven by the United Kingdom uh, troops. I, I kind of haven't, I've left off or maybe you'll invite me back in a year to talk about the um, empire uh, aspects, which would be the Anzacs and, and also the Indians. But uh, we're gonna focus in on mostly the, the British uh, part of it. Um, as I mentioned, the Egyptian Expeditionary Force was the successor uh, to the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force. Uh, that transition of name and organization occurred in March of 1916. Uh, and Murray continued to lead the, uh, the army all the way through 1916 into 1917. And we'll talk about that shortly. So um, I'm obviously working on putting an exhibit together and uh, this whole point in history is just purely fascinating to me. So here's kind of a uh, form, you know, here's how, here's how it all looks from an organizational chart perspective. You got the Egyptian Expeditionary Force up top here. This is where General Murray was or General Allenby resided. You've got the 20th Corps of the EEF, the 21st Corps, the Desert Mounted Corps. Then you get into the divisions that played underneath each of the different corps and the various brigades. And so um, I'm just in awe by what I've learned about uh, the London brigades and the Welsh brigades and the Scottish brigades. And, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself the smartest tool in the shed on a lot of subjects. And uh, I had to figure out what a yeomanry was. I wasn't quite sure, you know. I've kind of uh, likened it to our National Guard with, with a lot of pitchforks. Uh, this is a different, but, uh, I, I can't overemphasize how the organizational charts work. So here's 
example, the North Wales Brigades, the Cheshire Brigades, uh, the London Brigades. I did figure out that they like to keep boys together from the regions that they came from. Uh, they didn't particularly like to mix them up. It seemed like uh, from a behavioral sociological perspective, it just makes a lot of sense. These are things that I've stumbled upon uh, to keep the troops together because let's be honest, when you're fighting in these kinds of campaigns, you don't have drones and you don't have you know modern military uh, equipment. You need the guy to the right of you and the left of you to make sure that they've got your back through this campaign. So here's General Allenby and he took over uh, in, in uh, June of 1917. Um, he was a real leader. This guy here, he came in and he was a guy that I would be in a foxhole with. He was on the front line of the, of the uh, campaign amongst his troops and he really knew how to fire them up. Um, so here's a piece of mail that obviously with his signature on it. The campaign uh, is, is started over by the Suez Canal and worked its way up. Um, I like to just throw a little map in here uh, just to give everybody a visual aid. Uh, here's Jerusalem up here in the right corner if you see my cursor here. Uh, the coastline, which is this, is, this is where Jaffa is, Haifa is up in here. Uh, Nazareth is obviously over by Jerusalem as well. And so I have been working hard to figure out how these troops moved. Because again, you got camels and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, here's the uh, entrance of General Allenby's and into the troops in, in, when he entered in Jerusalem. He entered Jerusalem in December of 1917. So things kind of started moving pretty quick here. Uh, and, and you'll see that. Um, this here is um, the uh, uh, EEF headquarter uh, postmark GM1. Um, it's also here on a registered cover as well. And I'm gonna let me move this over here, okay. Um, and you can see this is sent from the director of Army Postal Services. They did use a lot of caches, which are kind of fun uh, for, for, as I showed you earlier, prisoner of war and here's mil uh, mail, uh, kind of caches and uh, there's hospital caches. So I do try to find these types of uh, items. Um, here's the GM2. This is uh, also uh, at the army level. Uh, and so I wanted to show different postmarks. Um, you'll notice, which has been fascinating, this is the A indice and here's the B, uh, you know, and so they, they, they are there. People collect all different things. You see the GM2 is spread out here. It's closer here. I try to let, not let myself get too uh, nuts about these things because I know some of you who are scientists, uh, you know, you like to measure and, and, and do all those things. I find that a little difficult. You'll notice here, this is a triangular sensor cancel. Here is more of a, uh, a, um, a, a horizontal style cancel, uh, base uh, sensor cancel as well. So I do watch those and pay attention to those things as well. Uh, it's always fun to see how they dressed. This is what the 20th, 20, the 20th Corps leaders, here's Lieutenant General Chetwork. Uh, some of you may know his name from your studies. Um, so I like to add these things in. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, this is how they went to, the, to, to war. I mean, they, they look like they're going to a prom, you know, dance. Um, this here, uh, and I got to find, I got to figure out how to do this. One second here. So um, here is the H-20 cancel, which you can see of the field post office for the 20th Corps. Um, I have it on a postcard. I have it registered. I, I just try to collect them in different ways. I like to track how they um, uh, move, which would be the routings as an example. Here's another style of sensor mark, which you can see here as well. This was kind of early. There are books that are associated with this. Uh, one book in particular is John Firebrace. Uh, he was a Londoner, I believe, that uh, wrote the, I think just the authority, the authority on the subject, uh, the British Empire Campaigns and Occupations in the Near East. And it's uh, a complicated book to, to use, but it's fascinating nonetheless. Um, this particular core was formed and I, I did a lot of research on, on the particular units um, because I think that's the fascinating part uh, of where they fought and, 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 and just the, bring to life a lot of what they were doing. 
back then. Here's the train cancel that they were using. I'm sorry. Oop, let me go here. Oop, let me see here. There we go. Uh, here's the 20th core train cancel. You can see the, the T marking, the H20 T marking uh, as well. And again, these are actually two different postmarks. This is the A indice and there's the B indice. Um, I guess this just tells me that they were made at different times or they were used by the different uh, you know, units that were traveling on the train. Uh, the 10th Irish Division, you know, at the outbreak of the war, it was formed in August of 1914 by Lord Kitchener, uh, who made a call for volunteers. Uh, this particular, you know, the Irish are tough, tough fighters, they're tough people. Um, and, and so this was clearly uh, a group that came out of Ireland and saw a lot of action in the Gallipoli and the Salinikia uh, campaign before they came back and, and regrouped in Egypt. Uh, they fought heavily in the Sinai and Palestine campaigns. And it was led by a, a major general Longley. Um, they fought in a, the third battle of Gaza and uh, you know, just really good stuff. Um, this one here is the 29th brigade that fell underneath that particular division. So they started to, I'm trying to show you how each division or corps and division and then the brigades that fought alongside Here's an example of 29th and how the postmark was uh, showed. I, I kind of put this up here to show this is the 20th Corps, 10th Irish Division, 29th Brigade. Here's the 30th Brigade. And uh, this is also um, uh, from the Dublin region in Ireland. Uh, they, they were the 1st Royal Irish Regiment, the 6th Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the 30th Light Trench Mortar Battery. I mean, th these, these folks were really uh, coming in there and think about it, they're a long way from home. They had to travel by sea to get there. Uh, these are young kids and boy, they were slugging it out and really fighting their way through uh, a major military war. Uh, this particular brigade did uh, um, fight along the whole campaign all the way to Jerusalem. And uh, you can see here that uh, this was returned to England. Again, some of these soldiers, uh, this first battalion, Royal Irish Regiment. I collect, uh, I like to collect the, the mail to specific uh, soldiers because I, I think it really brings to life the campaign. 31st Infantry Brigade, and again, under the 10th Irish Division, uh, this one here was uh, the second battalion, Royal Irish Fusiliers, the fifth and sixth Royal In Innes Killing Fusiliers and the 31st Light Trench Mortar Battery. So uh, again, tough stuff, good soldiering. Um, you know, I, I like to show the camp, the, uh, this is actually a, a 31 uh, manuscript uh, written in there. I think they pre-made these registered covers up with, with uh, some of the markings and then they just handed them out. And then when they were used, they, they manuscripted the specific brigades. Uh, the 53rd Welsh Division. Uh, this is territorial battalions that landed in Egypt after Gallipoli. Uh, they commanded by uh, Major General Mott, and he had three brigades, the 158th, 59th, and 160th. Uh, they took part in the advance from the Suez Canal once the uh, real war started moving eastward in uh, the first quarter of 1917, when we get to the first battle and second battles at Gaza. These are some of the most historical battles uh, probably in all of military history. Uh, that, that was a part of the Northern route. Uh, and, and, it, and again, just as recently as the last month or so, there's still battling going on with the, with the, from the, out of the city of Gaza. So a lot of hi historical to current uh, bridging that, that can occur. Um, this particular division, um, slugged it out all the way to, uh, to, to uh, the whole Sinai campaign, all the way out to Jerusalem and beyond. Uh, here's a picture of the 53rd Welsh Division. Again, I just love this kind of stuff. I think it really brings to life the kinds of uh, soldiering that was going on and, and the, the dapper and, you know, they're British, you know, you guys understand this better than I do. They just like to show their feathers as they say. Uh, underneath this particular division is the 158th North Wales Brigade. 
Uh, this is territorial units uh, from the 5th, 6th Royal Welsh Fusiliers. And, uh, you know, I, I could spend literally a lifetime digging into these. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by how much is on Wikipedia uh, concerning these units, these military units. Um, here's one with um, stationary, an active service stationary. Here's one, obviously, a registered letter as well. So I try to show it both ways. Um, for, for this discussion, I try to show it uh, non-registered as well as registered. And as you all know, uh, they, they were paying a small fee of, uh, I think this is a half a pence for, uh, to, to mail the registered letter. 150, 159th Cheshire Brigade. And again, uh, underneath the Welsh division, um, I, I, I think that it's just uh, fascinating. This here, you can see this uh, cache of the uh, one, I think it's 132nd. I'm having trouble reading it on my screen, but you can see they were using this, uh, obviously different caches. Here's the different sensor marks. Here's twice, it was censored twice. Uh, this happens to be not chronological. So this was late May of 1918. Um, you know, the war ended, uh, as you guys know, in, in uh, uh, November 11th. And um, this, they had already captured Jerusalem. This was going to Jerusalem. So it's kind of like inland mail, we'll say. 160th Welsh Porter Brigades, uh, commandeered by Lieutenant Colonel Pearson. And uh, he was serving as part of the 53rd Division. Um, you know, there was plenty of casualties in these wars, folks, I gotta tell you. And, uh, you know, you, I, I actually studied some of these units and, after Jerusalem fell to the British on December uh, 17th, the 160th seized the ridge east of Abu Dis and took 126 prisoners and two machine guns. So they were really fighting it out at the hand-to-hand uh, -hand level. Um, the Turks counterattacked, and you know things get get kind of bloody, as you guys understand. Uh, here's the 60th Division, London. So as you would understand, uh, they tried to again group soldiers territorially, geographically. Uh, this one helped in October 31st of 1917 to battle and capture Beersheba in the third battle of Gaza, probably one of the most significant battles in all of history. Uh, this was uh, where the war in the Middle East really turned under the leadership of General Allenby. He kind of faked the uh, Turks out because they were prepared for him to uh, uh, battle them up in Gaza and he moved into the middle part of the Sinai Desert to go after Beersheba. Beersheba, as you know from reading the Bible, is where the water wells are. And when you have to feed camels and horses and humans, probably in about that order, by the way, uh, you clearly need to have water. And uh, they were moving, they were building pipelines from the Suez uh, eastward as the troops were moving forward. But getting Beersheba was twofold. One, it was to get access to water. And then secondly, it was also kind of like a head fake uh, that the Turks started thinking, oh, the war was going that way. And they let their guard down up in Gaza, which is when uh, Allenby took over there. A D-60, a, a 60th Division postmark, which you can see here on the screen. Uh, 179th London Brigade underneath it. Um, I, I will tell you to collect these postmarks has been a 40 year journey. I mean, some are really easy to find, some are really difficult to find. You guys all, and ladies all understand that uh, as time marches on, it gets more and more difficult to find these and in a completed capacity. So I, I've been very uh, excited and, and vigilant in, in finding these specific unit postmarks. Uh, here's the 180th. Uh, a pretty important um, a brigade. They seem to show up in every single military map that I, that I looked at. You can see the postmark is the 180th field post office. And um, I got it all, all, on a pre-printed active service mail stationery, along with obviously a postcard uh, censored uh, and so forth. I've actually been fascinated to learn how the military allows its soldiers to write mail home. They're not allowed to describe where they're located. They're not allowed to describe the campaigns they participate in. They're not allowed to tell very much for obviously censor secret 
perspectives, uh, which is why these these items are get so censored. But they're allowed to call, write home and say hi. I'm I'm doing well, and I miss you, and I love you, and say hi to mom, say hi to dad, those kinds of things. Here's a, a picture of, and I'm going to have to move my. Hold on one second, everybody. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah, this is the Brigadier General uh, Watson of the uh, 180th Brigade, uh, also posing for a picture. I thought that it'd be nice to share that with you folks. 181st London Brigade. So you can see that the uh, 60th London Division is exactly how I described it. It's just made up of a bunch of Londoners. Um, I did find, uh, which isn't in this particular discussion, that the Indian troops, which have been fascinating to me, the Indian troops, and I know Bob, you're kind of uh, a collector in these areas, did merge and cohabitate alongside of the British in a lot of these brigades. So as the war moved on, they were moving some of the Indians troops, brigades into and alongside of the British. And they would use the same post uh, markings as well. Um, and, and I found that to be kind of interesting. I didn't find a lot of the Anzacs, the, the New Zealanders and the Australianders being merged in uh, to, to the British. Um, but I found it very interesting that a lot of mail that the Indian troops would send went up to the London and Britain and not back to India. So it tells me that it was British soldiers coming from India into the Middle East who had family members that were still back up in uh, Great Britain. A yeomanry division, yeah. So, boy, I, I have to tell you, I, I'm being forthright in admission. It's like, what's a yeomanry? You know, I, I thought it was something out of like a Hobbit story or something. But uh, clearly, these were farmers. Uh, I liken them today again to our National Guard. Uh, they were formed in regions throughout the United Kingdom and uh, they called them yeomanaries. I, I did some research, the yeomanary name and, and formational dates back into the 1700s. So uh, I, I, they probably still exist today. I'm sure they do if they were, uh, if, if, you, if you, you guys probably know this better than I do. Um, but I, I learned an awful lot about uh, Great Britain and, and uh, how their, the military was being formed. Uh, again, this is a very important group um, that fought all the way through the Sinai and into Palestine. 229th Infantry Brigade um, served in the Gallipoli uh, 1915 and then came back to Egypt and served under Allenby uh, in, in this particular campaign. The 229th Field Post Office, as you can see, marking here. Uh, this particular marking is December 2nd, 1917. Jerusalem fell on December 10th of 1917. So this, they were fighting all the way, their way up to the Battle of Jerusalem, which of course uh, is one of the most historical uh, tr city transitions in the history of the world. 230th Infantry Brigade, again, you can see the postmark that was assigned to it. Uh, at, at that particular era. 231st, the same thing on, on uh, active service stationary. Um, this, some of these brigades, I might add, and, and, and here's a good example. Um, on March 9th, the, 1918, this 231st Brigade was ultimately uh, transferred from Palestine up to the French front. And I assume, because I haven't studied it, but I assume that they needed reinforcements up there and they were pulling troops from down wherever they could, the Middle East, to bolster uh, the late World War I uh, campaigns that were going on in, in Europe at the time. The 21st Corps, now this is the next Corps, um, organized in August of 1917, once General Allenby took over uh, the Egyptian Expeditionary Force. And uh, you'll see that this is the H-21 cancellation uh, for that particular core on three different uh, uh, items here. Uh, the B, the B, here's an A indice. So, you know, it's, um, I, I try to do this as you can see uh, from various perspectives. 
here's a nice uh, request uh, stationary that there was handed out to the soldiers at the time. OAS, as you know, is on active service. Um, here's another, this is the H21. Here's some more H21, but here's registered as well. Uh, here's a plus, here's a cross uh, indice that you can see there. Some did have trains, some did not have train cancellations. I try to get them when I can, not always easy to find. Here's the 52nd Lowland Division uh, commanded by General Hill. It had three brigades under it, the 155th, 156, 157. Now, I'm gonna put myself, my neck out on the limb with all you experts on the uh, Zoom meeting here. You know, I think the Army at the EEF level was made up of a couple hundred thousand, I don't know, several hundred thousand troops. You know, it had a lot of, a lot of soldiers, a lot of mouths to feed, a lot of food, a lot of water, a lot of supplies. I believe the cores were like kind of in the, you know, 50 to 60,000 troop levels, if I remember correctly from reading. You get down to the divisional level, it's, you know, like the 20,000 troop level. So these are large organizations. You get down to the brigades, they're in the thousands. So um, then you, get, you can get down to regimental levels where you've got, you know, literally from hundreds to, you know, a couple thousand. And so you can see that this pyramid that I keep trying to show you is uh, the large military and then the smaller corps and then the divisions underneath and the brigades underneath that as well. You can see that uh, the 52nd Division ultimately was transferred uh, to France as well late in the, in the World War I. D-52, uh, here's an, a field ambulance cache down here on the bottom uh, that, that I'm getting, showing you. 155th uh, Scottish Brigade, again, part of that United Kingdom group. Uh, these were rifle and machine gunners. Uh, as you guys all probably know from reading history, the machine gun was probably one of the uh, most, most eventful turning technologies of World War I from Civil War era style soldiering with bayonets and, and single shot rifles to machine guns, and that played a vital role. There were, uh, there were some tanks in, the, in this air area. They'd get bogged down in the sands uh, as well. Uh, trains played a role as they were building trains to move the troops uh, along the Eastern Front as well. Uh, Scottish 156th, you can see the cachet here. Um, I love the soldier mail. It's all good stuff. A lot of fun. I'm going to kind of move along here. 157th, 100. Uh, here's the 54th Anglican Division as well. 161st Brigade. Here's Church Mail, uh, the Church Army that they provided them. 162nd Brigades as well uh, that they that, that that participated. 163rd Brigade. Here's some additional mail with the 163rd. And then uh, the 75th United Kingdom Division. This was made up of territorial and Indian units, like I mentioned earlier, the D-75 cancel. Underneath was the 232nd Brigades. These soldiers fought all the way through the campaign, 233, 234. I want to make sure I get you done by 7 o'clock, so I want to move along here. And then you get to the Desert Mounted Corps. This, I, I love this area. There's a lot of, of history to it. Uh, this is made up a lot of the Anzacs, the Australian, the Omanary Mounted. This is where you guys would see camels and horses uh, type uh, 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 soldiering. Uh, the HM cancel was for the, uh, the Desert Mounted Corps. The Anzac Mounted Division I, uh, was, was associated with this particular corps. Here's a pink registration. I love that one. Uh, Anzac Mounted Division, which, which had a train cancel, the TM1. First Australian Light Horse, the uh, uh, cancellation here, which you can see two different styles. Uh, one has a details FBO, and then here's a, a single round cancellation too. I want I like to show you that this is how they fought the war. They were on their they were on their um, on their horses. You imagine they brought them from home with them. Second Australian Light Horse Brigade. 
LH2. Uh, New Zealand Mounted Rifle Brigades, which you see the NZ. This particular corps was made up of all these particular soldiers under the EEF. DM2, which is the Mounted Division, the Australian Mounted Division. They had mounted and unmounted. LH3 was the third light horse. Fourth light horse brigades. Imperial Camel Corps, so you can see how they were, uh, how these particular, the, the CZ cancellations. And uh, then of course you can see how these particular soldiers were dressed, and how, how they went to the front line to, to soldier on. So now I'm gonna run through real quick the 1917 battles uh, that occurred. Um, and I'll kind of skip over this. The first starts, I, I kind of do this chronologically, January 1917, still under Murray, uh, called the Egyptian Expeditionary Force. And this particular, uh, month, you can see they moved from the Suez Canal up the coast in this map to get to Rafa, which was kind of a, a before they got to Gaza. And so they were encircling Rafa. This was one of a critical campaign because they finally moved eastward and moved the Ottomans who were allied with the, um, uh, the um, Austrians and the German soldiers. They pushed them back to Gaza. A small little area called Neckel. Uh, was ca was captured in February of 1917. It was essentially located, so like I mentioned earlier, it was more on the middle route of uh, of, of the Sinai, um, and it was uh, on its way kind of to um, Beersheba. So they 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 wanted to get they wanted to push the Ottomans back off the Suez Canal. Um, you can see they had Bedouins and Ottoman soldiers that fought in these campaigns, and this was in February. March is where the action began. This is the first battle of Gaza. General Murray uh, really blew it and he couldn't win this particular battle along the uh, Mediterranean coast. The, uh, the Ottomans and the, the Germans and the uh, Austrians were able to repel the uh, British back to uh, Rafa. April, the next month, was the second battle of Gaza. And this is where um, I do study, you know, how the troops were lined up. Um, and the, uh, it was fought 17th and 19th of April. Uh, they, the, the Ottomans were successful again in repelling the attacks. Uh, they suffered 6,400 casualties during this particular assault. So, you know, there was an awful lot of um, bad stuff that was happening. Here's how they were moving around in that era. This is how they had to, to move their, their, their supply chain. May, things started getting a little quiet, you know, that things were settling down, they were regrouping. So I, I do like to, to track the, the months. I just put a sort of a smattering into this particular story. Um, you can see that the uh, AIF, the Australians, were sending their own stationery in. And then June, this is when Allenby showed up. And as I mentioned earlier, he was a soldier, soldier. Uh, this is the guy who was given the task by the war office to capture Jerusalem by Christmas. And so he just went to work to win this particular uh, military campaign. July was kind of a regrouping. I think Allenby was repositioning himself uh, in terms of uh, getting ready to, to take, take on the Ottomans. Um, they did use um, cannons like this in the war. Uh, like I like to show those types of things as well. Um, August was kind of a quiet era too. Things were just kind of getting repositioned. The supply chain was moving uh, armaments and soldiers forward. September, about the same thing. And then October, Battle of Beersheba occurred. Like I mentioned earlier, this is when he did a head fake. Uh, if, you're, if, you're in the, if you enjoy sports, where he moved soldiers, largely the Anzacs on horses. And I, I know there's so many monuments uh, on Anzac Day, uh, where they captured Beersheba, it was it was again just a, a major accomplishment uh, on the part of 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 the Allies at that time, and it, and also they they were going up and taking on Gaza as well, which which happened right in early November, the third Battle of Gaza, and this is where they actually conquered Gaza, uh, which was a major stronghold for the Turks on that northern route. So this really led the the uh, 
the journey into Palestine. Um, they ultimately, in December, the very next month, they moved very quickly. They kept their pace and momentum, and they ultimately took over Jerusalem, which is over here on the right side, uh, and, and ultimately captured Jerusalem, as I mentioned, on December 9th uh, of 1917, and, and it was a major thing. Uh, they actually had airplanes, military airplanes, and here's a picture of Jerusalem from the air. They would they would go and they would do spotting and they would drop bombs on the enemy. Um, th there, I do have, have, have aerial military mail um, from the troops, but uh, it's clearly a major change in the way warfare was fought. Here's the white flag that was hoisted um, by the Ottomans in Jerusalem when it was captured. Um, here's uh, when they were entering Jerusalem, which is of course a very important point. Uh, of the of the of the war as they are ca coming into Jerusalem. Uh, if any of you have ever been there, uh, the uh, the gates leading into the old city. I always stop because this is where General Allenby entered the Jaffa Gate leading into the old city, which is what you see here. There actually is a post office there. Uh, I've sent mail from that particular post office home, and it's 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 one of my treasured pieces as well. Um, here's the copy of the letter of surrender right here on December 9th. And of course, there's General Allenby. And uh, that concludes my talk for, for tonight as far as the Egyptian Expeditionary Force. Oh, wonderful. Wow, that was simply wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope everyone enjoyed yeah. it as much. My husband was just floored being a military person. We, we have a bunch of questions. Um, Robert, is that, do you wanna start with the questions or? Robert, you're, you uh, you're muted. muted. You're oh, muted, yeah. Robert. There we go. Okay. Um, well, if the first question deals with the, um, in the expeditionary force units were not included in the EEF. Um, they actually were, um, but they, were uh, Indian forces that had become integrated with British units, which uh, Michael had mentioned. Um, there was one, um, um, one unit, uh, Michael, that you didn't mention, and that was the uh, Jewish Legion. This was the one that Jabotinsky put together. Uh, just wondering if you could comment a bit on that. I do have mail from the Jewish Legion. Um, you're absolutely correct. Um, I, I found that those were troops mostly from the Middle Eastern area uh, and, and the Mediterranean area, it seemed to me, uh, and uh, they fought in the campaign. I'm gonna be honest with you, Bob, they got the scrubbiest, grubbiest jobs and it was in 1918 that they really crossed over the Jordan River and as maybe you realize, it's very hilly there. It's very difficult. It's it's like 140 degrees temperature, and and they fought very staunchly alongside of the British. I also didn't mention the Belfair the Belfair Declaration, um, uh, which was in that era as well. Uh, it was important, and that's part of why that Jewish brigade, as you're mentioning, the Jewish Fusiliers, the 38th, 39th, and 40th Fusiliers divisions. I'll do that in a different lecture in a different day. Okay, well, I'll look forward to that. Uh, one of the questions here, yeah. So I'm, I'm just looking at the questions that were put in, but the, uh, there was one that deals with train cancels uh, applied by British military RPO and uh, actually did they process the on, on the onboard trains. And I guess I, I would add to that, that the British had built a railroad as they went through this campaign. And um, one of the things I like to collect is wherever that train stopped. And um, um, I can't imagine today that train operating and people tell me it's just all covered with sand from uh, uh, Kantara to, uh, to Damascus. Um, but I was wondering if you could also comment on, on your train cancels and what, what, what's really meant by this? Well, it's, it's a good question. I have a whole collection of PTO uh, and TPO cancellations. Um, I didn't bring them into this because again, this, this subject is so vast. I actually just showed a smattering of when a Corps actually was moving. They had their own specific cancel, not a general train cancel where all the troops could use. 
there were stationary offices as well that I didn't get into because uh, this is a, a, a massive field of, of items. There, <clears throat> I guess I would add that, that um, where the railhead was, where the last stop, this was often where the mail got on or got off. And yes. uh, uh, sometimes you see, in, uh, especially the, uh, um, uh, in the Indian FPOs, they'll identify which ones are, are railheads, not in the cancellation, but in the books that support the, uh, the study. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I'm having my Q&A that, that I'm, I've, I made it big so I could read it and now I can't get it uh, back to, uh, um, it won't scroll down for me. Um, uh -oh. don't, can, 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 you okay. take, can you take over that? There's going to be reverb. Jump in. Um, sorry, let me, let me go over here. Okay, so how come Indian, uh, do we do the Indian Expeditionary Forces? Harold's question? We're not included. How come they were not included in the EEF? Well, the the uh, Indian Expeditionary Force was, was really <laughs> broken up very early in the war. Um, and just really the, the British units became Indianized. So you'll you'll see British forces using an Indian FPO. And uh, by the time uh, this show is over, um, most of the British troops were being pulled out of the Middle East to go fight in the the big show in Europe. And um, so they, they actually used the term Indianized. About, about half a million okay. Indians fought in the Middle East. Wow, and I'm bringing people over. So feel free to unmute and ask your questions yourself. But um, your XFX corpse photo, Michael, shows the French troops with a French machine gun. Can you give a little bit more clarification on that or background? Um, hi, I have to think about that particular item. Um, you know, the French played a role in the region. I have a collection of French military mail. Uh, they, to my knowledge, they didn't really commingle with the British uh, much. They fought, they, they, they almost didn't even fight with them. I, I think they were there more for, from a police perspective. Uh, they did, their, the French Navy uh, was a transport. They did, you know, lob missiles or, or bombs or whatever onto the shoreline. Um, they were a lot, they were, I consider them to be somewhat ceremonial. And uh, as far as that particular item, I'd have to pull it out and look at it because I don't remember. Fair enough. Okay, so Joe Skidmore asks, and he's, Joe seems very, very knowledgeable. I can't wait, I hope he comes over and talks, but were the train cancels applied by the British military RPO? Or were they actually processed on board the train? My understanding is they were processed on the trains. Hmm. Okay. And let's see here. We'll go on. A anyone who's on, please feel free to ask a question. Or uh, make a Let's uh, see. <laughs> this is Harold Tuckfeld, and I had a question. During the battles of Gaza, were, were there any... Um, military ships involved in shelling Gaza. Yes. The Royal Navy, the Royal Navy supported the campaign off the coast. Okay, thank you. This is Bob Coles. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. This is a little off the subject, but not completely. I had I had written a question, but I'll ask it in person. Are you familiar with Oswald Chambers? No. Okay. He, he was a um, chaplain to the EEF in just north of Cairo, but he, he's actually very famous today through a book called My Utmost for His Highest. It's the most popular Christian, um, what do you call it, uh, the daily type reader. <laughs> he he uh, served in the, uh, with the EEF for a couple years through the YMCA. <laughs> he has a biography his wife has a biography, There's a lot of information in both those books on the EEF, sort of their daily life and how the YMCA interacted with them before they went off to Palestine. He was supposed to go to Palestine just before he left. He died from complications of an appendicitis. 
Hmm. Very, very tragic. And he had, he had his wife and his four-year-old daughter with him there north of Cairo for a couple years towards the end of the, the war. So apparently you don't have any uh, postmarks for Oswald Chambers. <laughs> no. Okay, I'll take a note and keep an eye out. Thank you very much. Yes. This is Dan Walker. Um, Michael, you, is there any good book on the uh, history, the general history of the uh, Middle East in World War I? Behind me is about four shelves of those books. But I'm going to tell you, Dan, the best, easiest, very comprehensive is Wikipedia. If you, if you Google the Sinai and Palestine campaign of World War I, you will get a marvelous expose of the topic. Okay. Um, yeah, if you're interested in, in the postal history of this, there's Firestone. Uh -huh. This is uh, British forces in Mesopotamia. Uh, Michael, uh, Jack here. Um, your presentation uh, was really interesting on postal history. I'm wondering as a stamp collector, do you, do you collect EEF stamps and their uh, overprints? Uh, specific to World War One, you mean? Well, well, the Palestinian uh, stamps were uh, EEF stamps, yeah. and then they were overprinted Palestine or Jordan or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in from a stamp collecting point of view. Yes, I do collect. Well, I'm a postal historian. Um, is my area, so I'm not a you know I don't collect the the stamps, but I do have a full collection of the British Mandate period which is when the EEF in uh, 1918 started issuing EEF stamps. So I do have a full collection all the way to 1948 when they left the region. Yeah. Somebody was asking about literature about the, um, the Middle East during that First World War. I could highly recommend a book titled Gallipoli by Alan Moorhead. It is focused on Gallipoli, obviously, but it also delves into the major strategy for the Middle East at that time around the 16th, 19, 16, 19, 17, 1918. So I would highly recommend that as a book to read. Thank you. Yeah, Amazon.com has a, just a plethora of books on the subject. Uh, Michael, in the last Israel Philatelist, I showed a picture of the Turks uh, sending a ship down to the Dead Sea. Did the British do anything with the Dead Sea militarily? Well, they did. Uh, that's you no know, so far down in the, in the in the valley area, and and that's where the uh, Jewish yeah. the Jewish fusiliers, the 38th, 39th, and 40th, wow. they, sent the, they sent the Jewish brigades down there, to the Dead Sea. To fight through that region and through the hillside and cross. Also, uh, the king. Whoever's speaking, I can't hear it. Hi. Yep. Mark Rowan here. My new password. Well done, Michael. I'm glad to see you followed my advice. Yeah. <laughs> How many years ago did we talk about this? 20? <laughs> it's beautifully done. Art Groton, uh, it's a pleasure to see you, my dear friend. And you're right, I've never gotten <laughs> that conversation. I'm so Good glad work. to see you, Art. Likewise, likewise. <laughs> Carry on. I'm going to shoot you an email. To Please more do. Details. We'll, co we'll connect offline. You bet. Take care. <laughs> uh, this is Harold Tuckfeld. Um, can, can I ask um, one question and also make an offer on something I have? So I, I have some covers, um, and I think they're fairly common, of the first set of stamps that were the EEF stamps in Palestine. And they had, um, you know, Army Post cancellations. Um, 
Do you have any further background on those cancellations? I do. Um, the military, you know, they, they were really in a transition, transitory period, transitionary period, because they were using military cancellations for civilian mail uh, into 1918 after they conquered Palestine. They needed to start uh, mail for the civilian population after they issued the EF stamps in February of 1918, and they were using military cancels into mid late uh, 1918, really till the war. I think I guess when the war ended in November, then they started changing as military cancels. The FPO cancels after that. Okay. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention. Um, Unrelated to the EEF, but related to the British Empire Study Group and the Palestine area, um, I bought um, a while ago um, a letter to Polish forces in Jerusalem from Anders Army, 1946, from um, a woman, perhaps a wife of, of one of the doctors in the Polish forces in 1946 in Jerusalem, basically stating, what, what is going to happen to us? You know, nobody wants us here in Palestine. If anyone is interested in a copy, it's, ri it's written in Polish script, an old Polish script, but I did get a translation of it. If anybody wants a, a copy of it, a photo of it and the translation, I'd be happy to send it. Uh, if you picked up my email at the end of this, uh, mbass at the... Uh... I guess mbass7446 at gmail.com. You're more than welcome to send it to me and I'll forward it to our editor of our Israel Philatelist. Okay, so it's mbass746. So, no, mbass7446. At? At gmail.com. Harold. Okay. Harold, yes. how did the Poles come to be in the region and what did become of them? So... My understanding, I'm, you know, I've just, just Googled a little bit about it. Um, so the, the Poles were basically recruited um, from, um, from refugees from Europe and Poland who, and from Belarus and Russia who wanted to fight against the Germans. The British army organized them. They fought in Europe and particularly in Italy and then were transferred down um, into the Middle East and we're in Jerusalem. And one of the very famous uh, members, and there were a number of, of Jewish fighters, uh, one of them was rather well known. And when Anders' army got to Jerusalem, some of the uh, Jewish soldiers wanted to fight in the War of Liberation uh, to establish the State of Israel. And, 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 and basically Anders' army, um, I, th I think Anders, said, okay, you can leave to, to do this. And one of the people that left to do that was Menachem Begin, who was a member of, of Anders' army. So it was a British organized fighting unit. And eventually, I think 47 or 48, the unit was disbanded. Now here was the problem. Um, these Poles could not go back to Poland. Uh, Soviets were taking over um, and they would be shot fighting with the British. So most of Anders' army, the Poles, settled in the UK. The UK let them in. Uh, Michael, during the war, I assume that the British captured a number of prisoners do you know where they set up the prisoner camps? They set them up in Egypt. And uh, there is quite a bit of um, military, uh, prisoner of war mail that I've accumulated, uh, but they, they, they moved them back into the Egyptian area. I'm wondering if there's any correspondence or postal history associated with Lawrence of Arabia. Hmm. You know, I haven't broached over to that uh, area. I've touched 
the name Lawrence of Arabia for obvious reasons. Um, I cut off pretty much at Palestine. Um, he did come over and worked with Murray. He reported over to the Egyptian, you know, expeditionary force and such. Um, I've never seen any mail, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's something that exists. My, my name's John Laurie. I'm a, I'm a Brit, as you can most likely hear. And my grandfather was in the RASC out in uh, Egypt, the Royal Army uh, Supply Corps. Uh, and he went to the, uh, he, he was at the capture of Jerusalem. Um, but uh, I, somehow or another, the correspondence which came from him in November, so the battle was in December, uh, came from Cairo. Any ideas how it would have got from Jerusalem to Cairo to come through the post? Um, yes, you know, I have seen the mail from those soldiers. There was stationary post office. I mean, you know, they were, they were moving quickly, these guys. They were moving from town to town to town very quickly. Uh, the right. main post office was back in Egypt, Alexandria, Cairo. So it wouldn't surprise me that somebody may have taken a, a satchel of, of mail, which your, is your grandfather or your dad? Um, My grandfather, yeah. Yeah, your grandfather may have had, and uh, it went back, I wrote it for dispatch. Okay, thank you. Were there, were there any religious overtones, such as uh, Christian, Muslim, or Jewish, associated with these battles? It's a very interesting question. Uh, I would say yes. Um, as I mentioned a few times, there was a Jewish, there was a, there were three Jewish brigades that fought in World War I. Uh, they wanted local uh, soldiers, just like we talked about the yeomanaries. They wanted the local Jewish soldiers that, that had a cause to fight. Um, there were Bedouins and there was, uh, you know, so, uh, they, they did get Egyptians and they grouped them to be support. Mostly support is what I found. They weren't necessarily frontline fighters, um, but Bedouins, um, I, I can't speak specifically about Muslim soldiers because I don't think there was. If they were, they were on the Ottoman side probably is, is probably where it was, that, where they were. Um, they, the, uh, the, the Muslim side probably fought along the Ottomans and the Austrians. So there was, a, there was some of it. Um, the literature doesn't really speak heavily to it. In terms of the Christians, of course, you know, the soldiers mostly from Britain and the empire were, uh, were Christian. So, you know, there, there was that aspect of it as well. What about some of the Indian troops? There must have been Muslims amongst the Indian troops. And six, too. Yeah. It hasn't crossed my research. You know, I've had so much trouble figuring out the battles and the days and, where yeah. they were and the units that I, I haven't crossed over to, to the socio side of it. But it's clearly uh, an element because it's the Middle East. It's the Holy Land. It, the Michael Hyde, it's... It's uh, Harris Woolman from London. Hi. Hi, Harris. How are you? Good to see you again. Yeah, fine. I mean, I've enjoyed your talk. And of course, we, we, you've touched on the sort of beginnings that I start collecting, which is where you're, you let it leave off, as you, I'm sure you know. Um, I, I've got some of that Palestine material from the sort of later period where you, you stop talking. And I, I go on to study the Israel military mail and the Israel military puzzle service, as I'm sure you know. Um, but some of the, um, the, you know, the next step on really was the Haggai mail and the and some of that underground mail that that started from Israel that led on to the Israel military mail and that is a is a whole subject itself which I just thought I would just say is really the follow up to what you've been talking about. Yeah, thank you for uh, for speaking up, and it's so good to see you, my friend. It's been quite a while. Can I ask a question? My name is Mike Wilkinson. I'm, I'm tuning in from Seven Oaks in South East uh, England. It's way past my bedtime. It's nearly half past midnight here. But it's, um, uh, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I noticed you had several covers addressed to Kodak. 
Mm. Uh, and I was wondering what the, what might have been in them. Clearly, the one to the cigarette manufacturer uh, was an order for supplies, no doubt. But uh, I was wondering whether this was the early days of, of war photography and whether Kodak would have been heavily involved in all of that. What a wonderful question, and thank you for staying up late to listen. Um, they must have, somebody must have raided the Kodak office to, un, to get all these covers decades and decades ago, because you're right, there's an awful lot of mail that has the Kodak on it. I can tell you that in, in uh, eBay, if you went into eBay and you look for World War I stuff, you will see a bazillion photographs from the war. So I think they must have been handing out what you'd call them brownies or, you know, little cameras or something. I do have back here collections of photography, original fo photographs, I might add, of the soldiers. And I think they were taking photographs and sending them back to Cairo uh, to, get them, to get them processed. So somebody must have raided the Kodak office, I think, is where a lot of this stuff was, was gotten from. Because, of course, later on, Kodak became heavily involved in air graphs and, and the like, but this is far too early for air graphs. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Michael. Uh, Michael, hello. Uh, good night from, from Russia. Uh, I have some question. Uh, in your very interesting pre presentation, uh, you uh, have some uh, church image, church cover. Uh, can you please show me this cover and uh, uh, tell me about it? I don't have the ability uh, right this minute to bring those covers back up, but I will tell you if you want to send me an email with your contact information, I'll give it to you again if you haven't written it down. You okay, ready? okay. Thank Michael, you. we Thank could you. also send it out. It, it, we'll put it on the website. It's okay. right on your presentation. So we could do that also for anyone who's interested. Just send, and if you miss it, just send us a note and we'll be happy to forward Michael's uh, e email on. Uh, I just wanted to make a note. We do have some attendees that I'm not able to move over as a panelist for some reason. I had the same problem with the CCNY. So I apologize to the five of you who are still hanging out as attendees, but you should be able to talk if you'd like to talk. So, sorry about that, the technical difficulties. And Michael, welcome I'm, from Russia. <laughs> That's great. Can I go on? Uh, Michael, I wanna thank you for the, the wonderful presentation. Uh, I noted the standard uh, sensor marks that are on mail that uh, the Canadian division uh, on their mail back to Canada from the European theater, uh, very similar uh, uh, sensors autographing, assuring people that they've read it. And it was, it's interesting to see that it's a standard mark uh, throughout the British army. Yeah, but be careful because the specific markings I showed tonight, which uh, were triangular or <laughs> horizontal, I find uh, through my research that they had very variations in the European theater. So, you know, there are books on this. Um, and again, if you write me, I can share with you what I know uh, because I got hung up a couple times on, I'm looking at a cover that I thought was from the Middle East because of the sensor marking. Turns out it wasn't. It was a sensor mark that really tipped me off that it was a European uh, field post. Mm -hmm and not a Middle Eastern. So there are subtle differences, uh, so you yeah. should be aware of. Uh, Michael, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering, have you broken any of this down by uh, artillery, infantry, <laughs> armor, and uh, air by any chance? Well, um, yes. Uh, but, but a little different than what you're thinking because that's a little more World War II topicals. <coughs> Mounted brigades, dismounted brigades. These are uh, foot soldiers. And I have, uh, if, you, if you went into my bed over here, this, this that I got over here with everything laid out on the bed, I actually do do that. I break it out. I'm, I'm taking this collection 
down into the details that you're describing. So um, it, it is such a complicated area, like you're pointing out, sir, in, in figuring out were these dismounted, were these mounted, were these infantry brigades? Uh, you know, I, I go crazy if I try to figure out their machine gunners, if they were camel. Some of them you can figure out their camel riders, by the way, versus horse. Uh, so I do, I do look at that. Thank you. I just wanted to say it was a very, very interesting, uh, very interesting topic tonight. I, I'm, yes. I'm into say good morning, Athens, Greece. Athens, Greece. Athens. Go ahead, go ahead, you talk. Go ahead. I was just, okay. I was just saying it was a very interesting. Go, subject. you go. Okay, I was just saying it was a very interesting subject because I'm into the M series of Egypt and World War II because when I was stationed in England, uh, Dr. Sprue, who was in the Coldstream Guard, actually gave me all of his correspondence to his wife while he was there. So I have that to start with. Um, and a funny thing that I couldn't believe this came on today because uh, just say that my wife and I are going to Egypt for Christmas. Uh, we're going to do the Nile. And I've been filling out all day today, if you can see this. I'm going to Israel the 25th to do a job there. And I've been filling out nothing but forms of why I'm going to Egypt, or to Israel. I'm sorry, to Israel. I'm going to uh, Naniyat to uh, a power plant there to install a gas compressor. So I'm busy filling out all these forms in in this 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 uh, awesome, uh, what is this, Hebrew that I've never seen before in my life that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little uh, tidbit Go ahead. that interrelates to this uh, talk. So if you land in Ben Gurion Airport, which is in Tel Aviv, and you right. have a map, you have two routes to get to Jerusalem. Right. You can take the highway, which is about a 22 and a half minute ride. Right. You can ask your taxi or your driver to take you on the old road to okay. Jerusalem, which Bring I have on now. Tell them to take you on the old old pathway, the old road, not the highway. Right. What you'll do is go through the Judean hills that all these battles that we talked about were fought, and you will actually see leftover tanks and leftover oh, yeah. stuff. I, I did the same in Alexandria. When I worked in Alexandria at Air Lakeed there, I went out to the desert, and there's still tanks there and everything from World War II just sitting there. You know, it's like in El, El, El Aman. It's just, it's just amazing, all the stuff you see in I'm very fortunate in my job to travel a lot. So, but yeah, Israel's my next, uh, <laughs> my next job. I was just in Canada doing one. So now I'm going to Israel. So yeah. So don't fair. take the highway, take the, uh, take the long road. It's well worth it. It's really, really emotionally wonderful trip. A very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. So Michael, you, you said that, uh, the Balfour oh, declaration uh, is for maybe, future, hey, thank you also. Uh, a future discussion. Uh, however, I'm wondering, is there a linkage between these battles leading to the Balfour Declaration? Uh, I actually have a postcard, a civilian postcard that references the Balfour Declaration. Um, you know, listen, I'm going to tell you all something that I discovered just a couple of weeks ago that as I'm putting this exhibit together and this whole story, I didn't know how, I didn't know what, what to call some of this. Is this, is this, you know, United Kingdom? Is this the empire? And the Balfour Declaration, if you study it, actually was a transitional document, not only uh, talking about the homeland for Jews, but it also was something that transitioned the idea of the empire to more of, of uh, the commonwealth. And it's a very important document because it, and it happened right here at World War I, that the empire started to change. And as most of you know from the history, it was that document that started to transition the future of the empire to more of the Commonwealth national uh, perspective that, that, you know, we, we, we live today under even. So, um, the Balfour Declaration clearly was was a was a was a historical document from a, from a variety of perspectives. I had to figure and out were, were these Empire troops or were these Commonwealth troops. Well, it turns out these were Empire troops. Commonwealth came later on. But now it's you. You've been trying to get in there, so. Can I go? 
Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, I would like, uh, first of all, to thank you for uh, the excellent presentation. Uh, it's uh, more than 2.30 in the morning here in Greece, uh, but I enjoyed very much your uh, uh, talk. I would like to ask you if, uh, from the philatelic point of view, there is any material uh, uh, involving the cities of Suez and Port Said at that time? Yes, quite a bit. I didn't show it today, but uh, very early on, the soldiers in 1914, when they were still a uh, part of the uh, Suez uh, Defense Forces, they didn't have the military cancels that I showed. Those came later on in 1916, 17. Uh, they were using Port Said uh, civilian uh, postmarks as, uh, so they were using all the, the uh, Ishmael, they were using all the Cairo, they were using all the different city postmarks to send the military mail back home. So their answer is yes. Thank you. Okay, Thank Keith. you. Keith. from Greece. Keith Harmer here. Uh, husband of Joan Harmer running this show. How are you? I'm good, sir. How I are you? I'm enjoying myself, especially listening to this. But Allenby, didn't Allenby also, wasn't he also in the Second World War or not? Um, oh my God, I stumped the band. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going into my memory bank. I'm getting a little older. Allen B wasn't in the Second World War. No, I think they moved him back to. I think they moved him back to the UK, where he served in more of a hierarchical role. Okay, uh, that was the first bit. I, I, you were. Everybody was discussing what a yeoman was. I was a yeoman in the U.S. Navy during Vietnam. And a yeoman in the U.S. Navy was basically a clerical job. Okay, that's all. However, I was the weapons yeoman, which meant I assigned everybody to the weaponry, including myself. So I had a lot of fun with that because I, I manned the number one mount on our destroyer. So I'm just telling you where the yeomans ended up. They ended up typing and pushing pencils. <laughs> Oh, and shooting guns. Okay. Michael, can I come in right to the beginning where you spoke about the field marshal that was in charge of Gallipoli taking the blame? Most of history blames Churchill for that. But when I was in South Africa, I was with Admiral de Robeck's grandson and he told me that the family put the blame for the disaster of Gallipoli on their grandfather's shoulders because being an old man, when he took the fleet in, he was tired and he went to bed. So instead of landing the troops, he was sleeping. If he'd have given the orders to land the troops when they got there, they would have been able to march straight through and take the whole area. The Turks would have fallen from that advance. That is what the family believes. And I think history has missed this point. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Smith. I love these stories. I told you that I started to think long and hard about this General Murray, and I started to research his background, and I found he was just not up to, this, to the level of running a Mediterranean expeditionary force. The particular uh, naval officer or commander that you're discussing, I, I don't know anything about him Say, he was the admiral of that fleet that that went in. He was in charge. Yeah, I uh, listen. They made some mistakes. That's for sure. When they they I, lost. It surprised the, me that they took time to take tea and go to then take their nap. <laughs> they 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 lost the element of surprise. Yes, and that was that was the the leading step that created the failure. One of one of the things that I read about 
this situation in the Dardanelles, and I don't remember the book that I read it in, but the, the comment was that the Admiral was concerned about the minefields in the Dardanelle Straits and was fearful of losing ships in the uh, minefield and therefore uh, changed tactics or strategy, which ultimately led to what you talked about. One question, um, for, the, for the airplanes that participated in reconnaissance and light bombing, where would they have taken off from and were they camels, Sopwich camels, British Sopwich camel um, airplanes? Well, they took off from uh, Egypt, from what I understand, mostly, uh, and they were able to fly up and, and over uh, the Sinai Desert. Um, as far as the specific kind of plane, that sounds familiar to me. I, I don't remember it off the top of my head. I have pictures back in this library behind me here that I have somewhere, but I don't remember it. Thank uh, you. I've got a postcard in my collection of, I think it's a Sopworth camel flying over that area. And as I say, I could look it up, but I think it was a Sopworth camel. Wouldn't that be poetic justice to have a camel in the air and a camel on the ground? Yeah. <laughs> Great presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Wow. That was, Donald, I love that background, the, the earth. <laughs> I think Dan Walker asked me uh, about uh, literature and so forth. You know, here's an example of one book that I have. It's called The Desert Mounted Corps, an account of the cavalry operations in Palestine and Syria. So if you go on the Amazon, you'll find anything and everything you want. But I would start with Google. I think that would be a good place. Wikipedia. Well, Michael, we could put some of the books that you recommend in the uh, forum. So that way people could go and look, look for them. No. Well, well so you have everyone quiet. It <laughs> Michael, was just, it was, it was going. Michael, it was a great pre presentation, and now I expect uh, about three or four articles for the journal. Yes, sir, Mr. Chaffetz. <laughs> I think we should all give uh, Michael a, a, a big hand and uh, yeah. thanks for a, a great presentation. And we look forward to hearing from you at a, at a future time because you've got a lot to tell. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Thank you, Howard. It was, it was so neat. It's like you can make a story out of every single slide. It was just so deep. Thank you very much, Michael. Especially having studied uh, some of the individual uh, troops and yep. their families. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I've really enjoyed this collection very much. Uh, it has overwhelmed me, but uh, I really appreciate everybody's attention and, and participation. You guys probably know a heck of a lot more about this than I do. Um, group and uh, so thankful to be here tonight. Particularly the, the way, particularly the ones that came all the way from Russia and Greece. <laughs> Michael, it was a very, very nice narrative that you gave. And I certainly enjoyed it a great deal. Thank the, you, Mr. White. The whole area, as, uh, as you stated, is very, very complex and and deep. And um, one of the one of the members, Dan Walker, in fact, asked to, asked you about books. I would recommend trying to contact Battery Press if they're still in business, because they specialize in producing uh, copies of official histories. Yes. And the the the, the books are hardbound and 
of very, very good, good quality. No, you've got one. I do. Yeah. Yes. Uh, they come, this is an original from 1922, but this is a reprint uh, for you all to see. You can probably buy them online. It is the brief record of the advance of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, 1917-1918. Uh, it's the official, to your point, sir, uh, official source published by the Palestine News. So this is great stuff if, if you dig into it. They have maps in here that like chronicle by the day where troops were. It could drive it could drive me crazy with what what you you know the whole thing. Yeah, I I appreciate books, and I don't think, and you can probably see behind me, I've got a few. I don't think I have any single book that stands me at any money. They've all earned their keep, time and time again. It's Thank sort you. of scary now that people use the internet so much, especially with the ability to you know, add text or make it uh, come up in a search engine. But I think the books are really a, a solid research uh, source. Joan, I'd also like to recommend for those still on the call here, YouTube. If you type into and do a ser search in YouTube for the uh, World War I Palestine campaign or Sinai Palestine World, or World War I in YouTube, there are videos. I was gonna show them, Joan and I couldn't figure the technology out, but there are videos of the war that are fascinating, fa absolutely fascinating. Michael, uh, one other question I might ask did, did you uh, learn about any of the, after the war was over, did the British leave any uh, military materiel behind? And if they did, who acquired it? Uh, well, <laughs> well, they didn't leave any military material behind. Uh, the, what are they, it wasn't the United Nations, it was whatever the-, the League of Nations. Yeah, I think the Paris Treaty or something. Paris happened is it became the British mandate. Right. So the whole area ultimately was controlled by the British who left their military troops back there all the way out to 1948. So, you know, all through World War II and the 1930s, there was uh, military troops throughout the whole area. Um, French, I think, controlled the Syria, Lebanese areas. And um, so I think the answer to your question is they didn't leave them behind. They actually you know, continue to stay fortified or stay militarily involved in the region. In a, in a broad sense, after World War I, you had another major war that followed on. It was the war for Turkish independence. And uh, that lasted for like the 1920s. Um, a lot of weapons went into the black market. And um, you, can, you can read about how the Waziris picked them up and uh, in, in um, what is today Afghanistan and Pakistan. The, but there was so much munitions left that um, um, yeah, the black market was booming. For what it's worth. Thank you. Reference point. Hello? Yeah. Okay. What? Can I go? I, I just looked up Allenby. He died in 36 at 75. So he missed the, the next big show. Yeah. <clears throat> Keith used a book, by the way. <laughs> okay. Well, again, thank you very much. Does anyone else have any other questions? I, I wanted to say thank you um, from Oklahoma for this wonderful presentation that um, has brought all these postmarks down to something that I have a picture of now in my mind, as opposed to just looking them up and finding what that, that stands for. And also for allowing me access to this Zoom meeting. 
um, in the in the British study group, um, which I don't really belong to. <laughs> but thank you so much. Uh, everyone's a welcome here. We the the membership's really expensive. It's like zero dollars. Okay, <laughs> if you want to come to the clubhouse, it's ten dollars. You know, when we get back to the club, we have a ten dollar fee that we give to the Collectors Club of New York to help offset their costs. But uh, short of that, the, the Zoom meetings are free uh, to participate on our website, that's free. Um, if you donate, any donations go right to the Collectors Club to help defray their costs. Sure enough. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. All right, uh, any, any other questions? Oh, Anthony, unmute. Is that a question? Uh, you're, you're muted. Hold on. I was just saying goodbye and thanks very much. That's all. Okay. Welcome. <clears throat> it's so nice to see everybody's stamp collections behind them. I, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Anyway, good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, good night. thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you, Michael. Great presentation. It was really fascinating. Thank you, John. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, all. So that was pretty nice. That was a great uh, one. John, uh, John. Yes. I'm Carlos Cotlier from Argentina, <clears throat> and I would like to write you an email. Can I have your email, please? Sure. It's um, Joan at Harmers International. I could send you. Um, Carlos, I think when you registered, you put your email yes, in. I registered. If you can mail me your email, that would be great for me. I will go ahead and do that. Always interesting. I just lost a whole bunch of uh, Nova Scotia to South America covers because I was a piker. I decided that for in Corfuia, I, I decided that um, I could buy a sports car for what they wanted for the cover. Yeah. So, you know, I had to pass. But, okay. Uh, so thank you. Um, so, Welcome uh, from Argentina. Thank you. Okay. Uh, but remember, I'm registered, so you have my email. Can you email yes. me your email, please? Y yes, I will. I'll do that right as soon as we uh, hang up, because I tend to, if I don't do it right away, it goes in. No, but if, if you don't hear from us, uh, you, you'll see on your registration, there is a contact. You'll be able to get in touch with either Robert or myself that way. We both talk, so it's easy. Okay, okay. Uh, this is Sam Fitting. I need the same thing from you, please. Okay. Oh, you stop. Thank Will you. Do. All right, we'll do that. So Robert, you mean, I went all the way into New York to the Sotheby's auction to see, see it live. Uh -huh. And I, this was the, the first time I went, there was a nice cocktail reception. This year it was 10, in, at this time it was 10 in the morning and it just went boom, boom, boom. Wow, just serious money. Yeah, it was. It was. It, and I was sitting. We were sitting next to one of the underbidders, and I had talked to someone who who said, "By, by golly, his client was going to buy the British Guiana," and he ended up he didn't buy it. So, I guess they thought it was going to go lower than what it, um, what it actually went for. Yeah. Um, can you see my email? John, can Excuse you see me? my email? Can you read? Uh, it? Let me see here. Hold on. We 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 have it uh, when you registered. Uh, um. Hold on. 
If you registered with it, I, I have it. Um, yes. I just can't I, get it. I, I registered myself, so you, you have it. Yes. Yes, then I, then I have it. Okay. And I could put it in, you know, it's, it's pretty easy. I could put it in the... Um, Yeah, I'll definitely, that's that's an easy thing to do. The registration list is right there. That's, that's me, pretty easy. And Rich, I will get to you. I have to talk to the big guy. He and I have been, oh. just been fighting over how much he was gonna let me pay. I was, I was hoping uh, that I would be able to show this while Mike was still on. It's a uh, it's a postcard of uh, something I don't know I don't recognize. It may be from the uh, the Dome of the Rock. It's but it's got it's got a couple of uh, one mil overprint EEF stamps, and it's got a date stamp on the uh, on the uh, forward side on the side of night uh, October of. Uh, 21. So I don't know what the legitimacy of this or the, or the, and it sent somebody with an Arab, Arabic uh, signature. It looks at hmm. anyway, and it's addressed to somebody in Harlem, Kentucky. But you know what? Take a picture of it or a scan, and Mike will send it on to Michael. Okay. Or can you can send it directly. Yeah, or you could send it directly because Michael's been kind enough to say that uh, he'd like to talk to anyone who'd like to talk to him. So as long as he says he, we could share it, we'll share it. So, if I can know. figure out the because, technology. <laughs> do you have a cell phone? No, not a smart one. Okay. Um, Someone? No, stop it. Keith has a flip phone. So it's a, I've uh, got a flip phone. Do, do you have a scanner? I do not. Now my wife has a cell phone, but I, I think she can only communicate uh, by text. Oh, okay. Um, Thanks. Let's see. Well, he needs to take a picture of it first. Um, well, there's the good old mail. We have fax. Yeah, yeah. I can, uh, I can uh, take pictures of the reverse and the, uh, the picture side and the obverse, and uh, and uh, I'll I'll get his. I have his email address, so I can uh, okay, get his uh, mail yeah. address. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Yeah, I met Mike right. when he was uh, president of the uh, SIP back in the early part of the century. Yeah, he was so great because I was trying to get people that we normally wouldn't, we don't get to speak. And I wanted something specifically on that area, you know, the, the Israeli area, because we, we don't hear about it that often. And he was so great to volunteer and it was, Fabulous. I think he could have he could have made a story out of every single, you know, every single regiment that he had there. Well, there's a there's a, a large part of the uh, modern Israel history that includes uh, British occupation of the mandate and, uh, you know, General Allenby and uh, all, of the, you know, the main road going across from uh, from uh, Jordan to Israel is the, the Allenby Street uh, bridge. Yeah, I haven't been there. How you doing, Mike? You're, you're quiet. To me. Yes, I am. There's not too many people here, so. Say good night, well, Gracie. <laughs> I'm gonna get going. Where All right, um, okay. if there's not anything else, do you wanna go and I can feed my husband? And I can that's, get breakfast. That's like a plan. <laughs> it sounds like a plan. Hi, this is Sam. <laughs> Please send me your email. Yes, I will. I have it right Thank here. I will definitely. Do. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, good night. Thanks, good night. Good night. Good night.
Goodbye. Okay, bye bye. Uh, okay, I'm going to ask you to log off because my mother would kill me if I logged off before you. <laughs> yeah, she did. My grandmother was always, you know, manners, manners, manners. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Right, thank morning. you very much. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.